In this session, we will be talking about submitting your manuscript for publication in scholarly journals. When you complete your research, the time now comes for you to decide on where you will be sending your manuscripts for review and hopefully to be published. In this session, we will look at several different aspects of the submission and publication process. We will talk about preparing your manuscript for peer review to ensure that a favorable review is in your future. We will talk about explaining the editorial review process and timeline so that you are familiar with what will occur once you click submit with your manuscript. We will talk about reviewing the disposition categories editors use, deciphering the reviewer feedback so that you could decide next steps in the process with your manuscript, and finally revising the manuscript for resubmission. In terms of preparing your manuscript for the peer review process, there are some things that you should do before submitting. First, you should proofread your manuscript. After you have proofread your manuscript, you should proofread your manuscript. Once that step is done, I would have someone else proofread your manuscript. No, you are not hearing things. Proofreading is crucial at this stage. As we will discuss later, failure to proofread your manuscript is one of the most important reasons why manuscripts are rejected for publication. Proofreading will help to ensure that the presentation of your work best represents your abilities as a scholar. In addition to proofreading, you also want to make sure that you have answered the big questions. If you remember from our previous session, the big questions deal with the what, so what, and now what aspects of your research and the implications of it. So you have completed your manuscript and you're ready to submit it for publication review. How do you select a journal? There are many journals out there. Some of the factors that you should consider when submitting a manuscript. What is the mission and scope of the journal? Every journal has a published mission and scope. You could find this either in the journal itself, usually on the back cover or inside front cover. You can find it on the author submission guidelines for the journal. Or you may find it on the journal's website, should the journal have one. The mission and scope describe what the journal was created to do, what types of works they look to publish. Make sure that your manuscript matches the mission and scope of the journal. If you have a manuscript that you are thinking about doing for a counseling intervention that you would use for individual clients, it's probably not going to be well received at the Specialist for Group Work journal. Second, take a look at the readership of the journal. Understanding who the readers are and who the target audience of the journal is will help you in crafting your manuscript. We spoke in a previous session about understanding whether your audience is practitioner-based, counselor, educator, or supervisor-based, policymaker or advocate-based, or fellow researchers. The readership and audience of the journal should be consulted when determining an appropriate venue for your work. 
if you have written a practitioner piece, it's likely not going to find a proper home in a counselor educator or solely research focused journal. Consider the target population. Was your study with children, adults, college students? A special population. Make sure that the journal you are considering publishes manuscripts dealing with the population you used in your study. What type of manuscript styles does a journal accept? Do they accept the type of manuscript you have written? We typically think of journal article submissions as being research focused only, whether that be qualitative, quantitative, action research, mixed methods, case studies. But in reality, that's just one segment of the types of manuscripts accepted for publication in scholarly journals. In a moment, we'll look at several of the different types of manuscript styles you will see in counseling journals. Finally, we want to pay attention to journal rankings and advanced metrics. In today's publishing world, these advanced metrics carry much weight in your career as a counselor educator and researcher, particularly if you seek employment in a tenure track position. Colleges and universities now are looking at not only how many publications faculty members have, but the quality of those publications and the quality of the journals in which they're publishing their work. We'll talk a little bit about the different metrics that are used and how they can be helpful and in some cases hurtful to your work. So let's take a look at manuscript styles. As I mentioned, there are several different types of manuscripts that can be accepted for publication. There are research manuscripts, which comprise the largest segment of submissions to scholarly journals. There are case studies that can be published. Theory and practice papers. These are typically more conceptual pieces about a new way of thinking about a client or a change in the way that we approach a certain issue or a diagnosis. There could be trends and innovative practices. Maybe you came up with a unique or novel way to work with a client that turned out to be quite effective, and you would like to share that with a larger audience. There could be professional issues pieces, dealing with current events and topics, And finally, there could be program evaluation. All of these different types of manuscripts can find a home in counseling journals. This list is by no means exclusive. There are other types of manuscripts as well. As you review the submission guidelines for many of the ACA journals, you will see these and other types of manuscript styles. Not every journal publishes every style. So you'll also want to make sure that the type of manuscript that you've developed is appropriate for the journal that you're looking at. You may have a great manuscript that really contributes to the profession and would be well received by counselors. But if you submit it to a journal that doesn't accept articles in that variety, it will not get published and it will not be seen by the larger audience. So do make sure that you're matching the style of your manuscript with the potential options that are available in the journals you're considering.
So that brings us to the journal citation, the metrics and rankings. So I mentioned earlier that this is becoming a bigger component of the tenure track scholarly publication side of your job as a counselor educator. As universities are deciding on high stakes decisions, in other words, awarding you tenure and promotion, they want to ensure that the quality of your work is being well received in the professional community. One of the ways that we could identify how well your work is received, the quality of your work, and the visibility of your work is by looking at these different types of citation metrics. The journal citation metrics help to identify highly cited journals in our field. Highly cited journals are those that receive a lot of traffic. Individuals are reading the journal, they are using the articles in those journals as citable sources for their own work. These journal citation metrics come from many different sources. There are some third-party journal ranking tools that try to provide a more objective measure of how well journals reach their audience, and allow authors to share their work. And there are also tools that are created by the publishers themselves. Several of the large publishing houses, Wiley, Pearson, Taylor Francis, they have created their own types of metrics and rankings for their journals. It's important to understand what the metrics that you're looking at mean and how those numbers should be interpreted. When looking at citation rates, do know that they vary widely by discipline. You should only be comparing or looking at the journal metrics within your discipline or subdiscipline. As a counselor educator, looking at the citation metrics for counseling journals is probably what you need to be doing. We'll talk in a moment, but many of the impact factors for the counseling journals lag far behind psychology and even social work journals. That's not necessarily a knock on the counseling journals because high citation rates do not measure quality of work. A lot more goes into determining citation rates. Here are some of the major citation metrics you may come across as you're reviewing different journals that you may consider publishing in. The first is the journal impact factor, the JIF. The journal impact factor is a ratio. It represents the average number of citations a document in a journal receives for items published in the previous two years. The JIF, or this impact factor score, shows how highly cited a document in a journal is relative to other documents in its discipline. So how you would calculate the impact factor you would look at the number of citations that a journal receives in a given year. So we'll say 2020. From articles that were published in the previous two years, 2018 and 2019. A second type of metric is site score. Site score is similar to journal impact factor. It looks at the average number of citations received in a year to documents published in the 
previous three years. So whereas the journal impact factor looks at how many citations occur in a given calendar year from publications in the previous two years, Site Score looks at the previous three years. It too is a metric that could be used to see how an average article in a journal is rel relative to others in its discipline. Next is the SCI Mega Journal Ranks, the SGR. This is one of the newer rankings. This is a ratio of the average number of weighted citations received in a year over the number of documents published in the journal in the previous three years. It's similar to the site score, but the difference here is that these are weighted citations. In other words, this ranking metric takes into account where the citations occurred, and it will weight them based on the prestige of the journal in which the citation occurred. So if I write an article and you write an article, and both of our articles are cited five times, but your article appears in higher ranking journals, you would have a higher SJR ranking than I would. And then finally, we could look at the H index. The H index or Hirsch index is a ratio of the number of articles in a journal that have received at least H number of citations over a given citable period. It's a ranking that allows you to see if your work is above average or below average compared to other articles that have come out in a specified period of time. All of these different rankings can be used to determine which journal might be most appropriate for you to publish in. Some universities may have strict guidelines on where you can and cannot publish your work. They may have requirements for the different levels or tiers of journal that you should publish in. Many of the Research One institutions require individuals to publish in journals that have high impact factors, and they may even specify a cutoff or a threshold in which you must publish in. As you review these citation metrics, there are a couple things that you want to keep in mind. First, you want to keep in mind the publication date. Some of these metrics take into account larger publication dates when computing their ratios. Are they looking at two years, three years, or beyond? Publication date also becomes important when you consider the type of work we're talking about. In some fields, there are rapid changes or new developments and discoveries that are constantly reinventing the field. In other fields, there is less of a focus on innovation and more on developing a deeper understanding of the content. For example, in counseling, a journal that's focused on neurocounseling is probably going to have more cutting edge research than a journal that focuses on a more humanistic or existential approach 
topics that have been around for many decades. Those journals that have more cutting edge, ch rapid pace changes in the field are likely to have more citations because the field is changing and people need to be citing the new work. You should also consider that impact factors are related to the journal and not to the work itself. You may have a superior quality manuscript that has been accepted for publication and is really a groundbreaking article that is highly cited, but it appears in a lesser known journal with a lower impact factor. That factor is related to the journal, not your work. Newer metrics are now coming out that are author metrics and article metrics that take new algorithms and include in the social media references to show how much an article is being cited as opposed to just the source it comes from. Typically, review articles do not receive much citations. Literature reviews or field overviews are often not cited as much as research articles. Clinical journals, which may come out more frequently than other scholarly or academic journals, have a larger opportunity to develop greater numbers of citations because they have more issues and more articles that are coming out. And finally, uneven coverage. Most of the social science and human services journals have lower impact factors than other fields in the hard sciences or the medical field. We talked earlier about journal impact factors, and it's a, a sliding scale. You'll note that many places that are tier one research institutions will put caps or limits on the places that you can publish in, typically asking you to publish in journals with impact factors of two, three, or above. In the most recent year that data was available, the highest rated counseling journals, which are the Career Development Quarterly Journal, the Journal of Counseling and Development, and Measurement and Evaluation in Counseling and Development, typically have impact factors that are in the 1 to 1.2 range. Again, that does not mean that these are less quality journals or that the work published in them is inferior to that published in other journals. It has to do with scope and readership. Counseling journals typically have a smaller reach and less readership than a psychology or medical journal. The number of articles published in those journals is far more than are published in counseling journals. With less articles and less people reviewing those articles, by extension, fewer citations. So once you've identified some potential journals, you could begin formatting your manuscript. Some tips or ideas I have for formatting your manuscript. Review the target journal submission guidelines. Every journal will have author guidelines or submission guidelines that you can review that tell you what you will need to do to submit a journal article to that journal. Make sure you follow those guidelines precisely. We'll talk later, but 
failure to follow submission guidelines makes up a large percentage of the manuscripts that ultimately are rejected for publication. I also recommend you review past issues of the journal. And I do so for a number of reasons. One, I would look at the editor of the journal. Review issues published under that editor. You will get a sense of what that editor looks for in terms of style and formatting. Make your article look like those other articles. You also can see the different types of manuscripts, both type and content covered in those manuscripts that are published in the journal. This will give you a sense of what the author should look for in submitting a manuscript. The editor's vision typically comes out in the types of manuscripts you see published in the journal. It's also helpful to cite from that target journal. If you're going to be submitting to journal A, you probably are best served having some of your reference and citable sources come from target A journal. And finally, align your writing to match that target journal's mission and scope. Again, I cannot emphasize this point enough. It's important to make sure that you align with the mission and scope of the journal and to some degree, the parent organization publishing that journal. Journals exist for a reason. They come at a great cost to organizations as well. They have created these opportunities to advance the knowledge base supporting their position in their organization. So make sure that your articles match those guidelines. Once you've attended to these pre-submission ideas, you're now ready to look at submitting your manuscript. Most journals now utilize an online submission platform where you upload your manuscript and other information about you and the documents you're submitting rather than sending copies to an editor. When you submit manuscripts online, you typically are asked to prepare a full manuscript with a cover page and blind copy versions. When they talk about blind copy versions, you are to remove all reference to you, the author, in that manuscript. Now, typically, people think that means take your name off the cover page which it does, but that's only part of it. You also want to eliminate your name from the metadata. So if you were to look in a Microsoft Word document and you look at the file options, you want to be able to disable where it identifies who you, the author, are. You also want to remove any reference to other works of your own that you are citing in the paper. In the blinded version, you will remove your name and refer to yourself as author with whatever year coincides with the article that you are citing. When manuscripts are accepted for publication, at that time you'll go, you will go back in and you will enter in your full name as you unblind the manuscript. You also want to keep track of your page count, character count, and number of visuals that you have. In all of these submission platforms, you will be asked to report on the length of your manuscript, and that could be how many pages, how many characters, could even be how many words are in your manuscript. 
And you'll also report on the number of visuals you have. Visuals refer to tables, figures, graphs, or line art that you have. All of these are keyed in and coded differently in the submission process than a typical page of narrative typeset. You'll need to identify some keywords. Most journals now ask for three to five keywords. And these are words that will be used to index your article. Much like when you do your lit reviews, you go to the library database and conduct searches. That's what these keywords do. They help make your article searchable to others. So as you're writing the keywords, it should not be a quick exercise where you just pick the first three or five words that come to your head, the first three or five words in the manuscript. These are actually important decisions. This is going to help your work get out there to a larger audience. Think about the words that best capture what it is you did in this article and in this study that you're reporting on. Use those as your keywords so when other people search, your work comes up. And then finally, crafting your cover letter. Cover letters help communicate to the editor what it is that you're sending. In a typical cover letter, you'll want to introduce yourself, talk about your manuscript, usually presenting the title of your manuscript, maybe a little short bio about what the manuscript is about. You'll want to identify the section to which you are submitting. So if you're submitting this as a research, as a practice piece, as a case study piece, whatever categories the journal has, let the author know. Chances are that editor may have associate editors working with the journal who are assigned to different categories. Those associate editors then become the point person in the review process for your manuscript. Making sure that it is routed to the correct individual is helpful in preventing any delays in the review process. You could talk about your goodness of fit. A brief statement, a sentence or two at most, about why you think the topic of your manuscript is a good fit for this journal. Perhaps it answers a call for papers in a special issue. Perhaps you've identified a gap in the coverage in the journal where your particular topic has not been addressed before or it has not been addressed in a period of many years. You'll talk about your adherence to IRB and ethical compliance, that you conducted your human subjects research in an ethical manner, and that you adhered to all ACA code of ethics in terms of research and publication. And finally, you'll provide point of contact information. If you're working collaboratively with a group of colleagues and you are going to be the administrative author for this piece, provide your contact information so that the editor and reviewers can get in touch with you as they need to later in the review process. So here's an example of a cover letter that you can draft. And again, these templates are used to get you started, get a feel for what goes into these letters. As you become familiar and gain experience in the process, you could start drafting your own to make the language more your own that fits your style. So now you have all of the elements submitted and your manuscript 
goes into review. What does that review process look like? Typically, it begins with an administrative review. Administrative assistance for the journal will pre present an initial checklist that they will go through to ensure that the manuscript meets all the minimal qualifications for that journal. Specifically, they look to see, did the author adhere to the author guidelines in the submission? If not, a rejection could occur before the manuscript ever goes out for review and anyone gets to offer any critical feedback. This is why it's important to make sure that you pay close attention to the author submission guidelines. You don't want to have your work rejected before anyone really gets to look at it. At that administrative level, there could be a chance for you to revise your manuscript before it even goes out for reviewers. Maybe the editorial office sees potential in your work, believes it a good fit for the journal, but there is some element that needs to be addressed before it can be reviewed. In these cases, you may be given the opportunity to quickly address that item and get it back into the review process. After this is completed, or if this is not needed at all, your manuscript is sent out for review. This whole process of administrative review is usually completed within two weeks. From there, it is sent out for peer review. Most journals use two to three reviewers per manuscript, and those reviewers complete a blind review of the manuscript. They do not have any information as to who you are as the author. Because journals now use the online submission portal, when reviewers sign up to be reviewers, part of the onboarding process, it asks them their affiliation, both where they work, where they went to school, universities they have been employed at in the past. And when new manuscripts come in and there seems to be a match between where an individual works and the employment setting of the submitting author, it will flag the system to send it to another reviewer and not choose that reviewer. So as best as possible, these are blind reviews where the reviewers will not know who you are. Reviewers are usually given 30 days to review your work and send it back to the editorial office. Sometimes challenges arise in this timeline. Keep in mind that the peer reviewers are doing so on a voluntary basis. Although they agreed to do this work when they sign on to be a board member, things happen throughout the year that may get in the way. It is not uncommon at all for reviewers to be delayed in sending back their responses or at the last minute decline to submit a response, which then triggers the manuscript having to go out to another reviewer delaying the process. Best case scenario, these reviews come back to the editorial office within 30 days, but I would usually say it's more six to eight weeks is when reviews come in. Depending on the size of the journal and the number of individuals who work in the editorial team, those reviews may go to an associate editor who will then collate them and offer his or her own decision on the quality of the work. Or it may go directly to the editor who has the ultimate final say on whether manuscripts are included in future issues of the journal or not. At the editorial level, 
the editor will look at all of the review feedback that comes in, both from the blind reviewers, the associate editor of available. The editor needs to consider past and future issues. Sometimes a work may be quality writing, but it's on a topic that three or four other articles have just been published in the past year. Or it could be on a topic for which a special issue is planned later in the year. As the editor considers the layout of future issues, manuscripts may or may not be accepted based on where the journal needs to go and where it has been most recently. At that point, the editor issues a decision, which is communicated to the authors. Some of the decisions that could be rendered a manuscript could be rejected for poor quality. Poor quality journals have fatal flaws in some way that really cannot be rectified through the revision process. These issues could be related to the writing or format, the poor execution of the research design, or just an inability to correctly interpret results and translate them into practice in a discussion or implications section. There also could be a rejection because it's a poor fit for the journal. It may be a study that was well done or a well-written manuscript, but it just doesn't fit for the journal. Usually at this level, the editor will try to suggest other journals that the author may consider submitting to in the future. We could also see, except with major revisions. At this level, this revise and resubmit, you will need to Listen to the reviewer feedback and make corrections. At the major revisions level, there is still a sense that this manuscript has some promise. There is some potential for it moving forward, but there needs to be some major things addressed. Major revisions may include Wholesale work on certain sections of the manuscript, maybe a reordering of a lit review or a request to consider additional sources not previously cited or to further the implication section of a manuscript or to ensure that the description of a study and its participants are well described. A minor revision manuscript is one in which there are more grammatical or formatting issues that need to be addressed. On the whole, the major parts of the manuscript are there, but tweaks need to be made. And then finally, there is a outright acceptance. Eventually, Hopefully, you reach a point where your manuscript is accepted for publication. The number of manuscripts that are accepted for publication compared to the total number of manuscripts submitted in one year is actually quite low. Most manuscripts are not accepted for publication, and we'll talk about that in a moment, why that is. When looking at the acceptance rates of various journals, it's important to keep in mind that how these acceptance rates are calculated varies across disciplines 
and even among journals. Some journals may look at taking all submissions and then determining how many of those submissions ultimately were accepted for publication. Other journals may look at only the reviewed manuscripts. So those articles that never go out to reviewers that are rejected in the editorial assistant administrative review are not included in calculating acceptance rates. Other journals include revised submissions. So if you get a revise and resubmit, whether it's a major or a minor revision, that revision that you submit counts as a second manuscript. So facing rejection. Rejection is a common experience in academic publishing. It's not one that we like, and it certainly doesn't feel good, but it is common. And it should be something that you start to come to grips with because you will experience it in your careers. Everyone who publishes deals with rejection, even those that have been publishing for many, many years. Most of the academic journals have acceptance rates less than 40%. On average, the ACA family journals across all of its divisions typically reject 75% of the manuscripts they receive. So a one quarter or less actually will make it into print. As I mentioned earlier, not all of rejected manuscripts are poor quality. Other factors may play a role in rejection. There just may not be the fit. There may be a better journal home. There may be uh, oversaturation of coverage on a topic. All of these things may play a role. Here are some of the reasons for rejection. So this was a study that was conducted of journal editors across disciplines asking why they were rejecting manuscripts. You see some of the top reasons here, unimportant or insignificant contributions. Again, journals cost money to publish. Putting your work out there in the universe for people to see costs the organization that sponsors the journal. As a result, they want to ensure that the work they are putting out there is meaningful and makes a contribution. Your work should have novel findings or add to what we already know about a topic or issue. Second most common reason is methodological flaws. These types of fatal flaws in how your research design was executed sabotage you from the beginning. It's important to make sure you check with your faculty or peers or consult with statistical references that you have to make sure that you are conducting the study appropriately and using the right analyses. A third reason for rejection is a lack of a theoretical foundation. Your work needs to be grounded in some theory or understanding of why you're looking at the variables you're looking at in the way that you're looking at them. Theory helps to guide what it is you attempted to accomplish with your study. Without a theory grounding your study, it's difficult for viewers and by extension readers to really understand what it is you're trying to do. And then the last two tied at 10% each a poor writing style or presentation, and a misalignment with the journal's mission. 
Okay. If you are submitting to a journal and it's not the appropriate source, your work will be rejected before it even has a chance to receive feedback. Similarly, we talked about last session, if you have a poor writing style and there is many grammatical and style and formatting errors in your work, it's going to detract from the quality of your work. It's going to leave a bad taste in the mouths of reviewers and likely lead to you getting a rejection decision. Now, we typically hear rejection and we think negative, but I want you to realize that rejection is not the end of the road. Rejection just means that your manuscript is not going to appear in that journal. It does not mean your manuscript will never appear in print in any journal. Some helpful hints when you receive that rejection notice is to review the feedback you receive. When you review the feedback, try not to take it personal. Remember, this was a blind review. The reviewers do not know who you are. They're simply commenting on the work they received and the quality of that work. You may have thought this was a top quality research study. And so when you receive negative feedback, it's about the work, it's not about you. It's not an indictment on your skills, abilities, or intellect. So take a step back, put it aside, don't look at it. Don't make decisions in the heat of the moment when you're emotionally charged. Set it aside for a week and then come back to it when you could look at it again objectively. At that time, reread the feedback. Start to now look at it from a more objective measure. What can you learn from your mistakes? Some of the feedback you receive, you may identify that, yes, that was something that you could address. Make those changes in your manuscript. Consult with others. Some of the feedback you receive, you may have questions on. You may not understand what the reviewers are talking about, what they're getting at. Talk with others. Talk with your faculty, your mentors, your colleagues, your supervisors. See if perhaps you're misunderstanding what they're saying or there's a source you could go to for more information. Once you make those changes, find a new home for your work. Again, the rejection just meant that the previous journal you submitted to was not the best place. Maybe there's another home. Maybe there's one that's a better fit. Maybe you need to look at a lesser tier journal. A rejected manuscript should not just be tossed aside. Don't waste the time and effort you put into a research project. Always try to revise and learn from your mistakes and move forward with it. Now let's say your manuscript is accepted. Congratulations. Even though it's been accepted, there's still some more work you need to do. Accepted manuscripts still have some tasks for you to address. Once your manuscript has been accepted, it's typically put into the publication queue. In that queue, it will be assigned to a copy editor who will go through and begin reviewing and proofing your work. That copy editor may have additional queries for you that you will need to address. Please try to address those as quickly as possible so as not to delay publication of your work. You may be asked to submit copyright forms. Once your manuscript is accepted for publication, 
and it's scheduled to appear in print, the copyright to your work is actually transferred over to the journal and to the publisher. Although you're the author, you're no longer the legal owner of the work. There may be last minute updates you need to make. Perhaps you're a doctoral student and in the time from when you've submitted a manuscript to its acceptance and ultimate publication, you've graduated and moved on to a new job. Or you're in a job as a counselor educator and you're moving to a new institution. You'll have an opportunity to make those last minute updates before it goes to press. And then finally, you will get to see the galley proofs and review them before it goes to press. The galley proofs are your manuscript as it will appear in print. It has been typeset and formatted to look like what you see when you review articles. At that stage, only minor edits can be made as Larger changes typically will throw off the formatting and the typesetting. Minor edits are a typographical error or a miscalculation of a number. Once all the editing is done, your manuscript is ready to be distributed. There are actually several different ways now that journal articles get into the hands of readers. The traditional way in the top of this infographic here is the green open access. So traditionally, scholars have published in subscription-based journals. These are journals that are owned by different organizations. For example, the Journal of Counseling and Development is the Journal of the American Counseling Association. It goes out to members of that organization. They receive access to it first. Others who are not members of the organization can access it, but can only do so after an embargo period. Different publishers and different sources have different embargo periods. They can be anywhere from six months to 18 months. So if you were not a member of ACA, you would not be able to access JCD articles for a period of one year. After that period, when the embargo is lifted, everyone has access to those articles. A second type is a hybrid option. Subscription-based journals that have an additional open access option. Open access is the newer trend in publishing, whereby your work is made available to anybody and everybody. With this hybrid option, journals will offer you the opportunity to add open access for your article but it comes at a cost, and that cost is transferred to you, the author. Typically, open access publishing costs are anywhere in the one to $3,000 range. The benefit is it provides immediate access to your work to the scholarly community. The drawback, of course, is the financial aspect. So you need to consider if that is something you as an author are willing to take on. A third option is to publish directly in an open access journal. Open access journals are not subscription based. They do not have an organization behind them that uses membership dues to support the cost and operation of the journal. The cost of publishing is transferred to you, the author. 
authors pay a processing charge for their manuscript. It could be a review charge or a publication charge for the manuscript. Open access journals each have different rates that they charge. You could end up paying anywhere between 500 to several thousand dollars to have a manuscript published in an open access journal only. As you're considering journals, you'll want to think about what's most important to you and what resources you have available to you. If you believe you have some groundbreaking new findings that are bound to revolutionize your field and you want to get them into the hands of practitioners and scholars as quickly as possible, the open access options may be best. However, if funding is a concern, people still use the subscription-based journals. That still represents the most common approach to publishing. So what is the benefit of open access? You get to be at the forefront of changes in the profession. Perhaps your study, as I mentioned, is very revolutionary and takes a novel look at an idea, and you publish in a subscription-based journal, and it has a 18-month embargo on it. Well, over the course of the next year and a half, two, three, four, five others may publish in the same area as you. If they're publishing in open access journals, their work is going to come out before yours. Traffic will be driven to their articles. They will become the citable sources as your work kind of sits waiting to be released to the larger audience. If your work is funded and you have a grant supporter behind it, they may actually want you to go the open access route to ensure that the work gets out there quicker and to a larger audience. So you'll need to weigh the pros and cons and think about the benefits and the drawbacks to going open access or subscription access. I certainly recommend that you talk to your advisors and your mentors for information on what may be best for you. While there are a lot of benefits to open access, one of the drawbacks are that there are now a large number of predatory or phony open access journals out there. Anybody could start a journal and ask you to pay a publishing fee to have your work submitted. Some ways that you could tell whether a open access journal is legitimate or if it's phony is by the information that's included in there. If they're making claims that your article will be reviewed and published quickly, and when I talk about quickly, I'm talking about in a matter of weeks, that's probably a phony site. It takes a while to get a peer review process done. We talked earlier, you're looking anywhere from a month to two months to get a peer review of your work. If the website guarantees publication, that is a predatory journal. Open access journals, even though they are charging you to publish your work, not all work is accepted. It would be to your benefit to do research on the journal that you are considering publishing in to see if it is authentic or if it is more of a scam journal that is just preying on individuals and taking their money. You could search the title of these journals to see the reviews that come up on it. 
see who's publishing in these journals. Make sure if you're going to be spending the money for an open source journal that you're doing so in legitimate venues. So there's a lot to think about when you're getting ready to submit your work for publication. Keep in mind that there are specific guidelines that you should follow and certain steps that need to be taken along the way. It's not a quick process. It's going to take time. So don't become discouraged if you're going weeks or even months without hearing back about your work. I know it's exciting to submit and then wait anxiously to get the results of that review, but it takes time. If the review comes back negative and your work is rejected, don't take it personal. Everybody has their work rejected. If manuscripts are being accepted 25% of the time or less in the ACA journals, that means a lot of people are experiencing rejection. So you are not alone. Take what you've learned from that process and use it to be more successful as you revise and resubmit to a journal that may be more appropriate for your work. Again, this is an exercise that is going to take some time and it's going to take some practice. And the more you do it and the more you start to identify what makes for a successful submission, the more likely you're going to be to realize your goals of getting your work published.